probably not a bad idea um, because I don't know if it's a bad idea I just tell you that uh, every year it counts like five that's all like uh, like uh, you, you you look at you me age. right now and you wouldn't believe I'm 25 I am <laughs> You're actually looking younger, if that's possible. Maybe, yeah. yeah. Maybe having kids and running a startup is actually the way, in, the, 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 the route to eternal life is actually. I mean, 100%. Just max it out. I would strongly recommend uh, to do this to anyone that's uh, thinking that uh, either having uh, kids or starting a business is a good idea. You should do it at the same time. That's the best yeah, cocktail. Yeah. yeah. No, get 100%. all the bad ideas together. Yes. <laughs> do them all at once oh my um, God, yeah. Yeah, yeah that is the way that is the way no um but like i say i think there probably is never a good time for either of these ideas right and if you just stayed and, and waited for the moment it just never is going to happen so i think you agree i think you uh um, you uh on, on the business side of things you don't decide when you have a good idea and when it comes you just need to go with it and, and like you said i think uh, there might be better moments than others but there's no ideal moment and on the kid side i would like to think that uh, most of the time uh, or the ideal scenario is that uh, you plan on doing it and you're a little bit prepared psychologically for what's about to come but i think in both cases i had a, a discussion with a, another founder here in copenhagen last week who has young kids as well i think on on both cases um uh, society is not really uh, truly honest about uh, what it is and now uh, uh, exhausting you know there's this romanticized idea of like you starting your own business you're going to be free it's going to be amazing and everything it's great but it's hard and it's exhausting and and just i think a lot of similarities with having kids yeah yeah absolutely i'd be interested folks so uh, for you for the parents out there um i mean when you were having kids was it like entirely fully planned out was it like did you have like a gantt chart sorted out or something or did it just happen i mean sometimes it happens right without necessarily you know overly planning of course you know you're, you're with your partner things happen of course they do now you know nature nature takes its own path <laughs> um so so yeah i mean having having the kids and then having to juggle that along with with work and you know new projects i think mm -hmm. that's that's all all part of the thing um and in fact probably something underrated in terms of how we think about people in teams because teams are often i think idealized purely for the one atomic individual like we design it as if the person actually has no relationships outside of work at all um, uh, you know, when you think about the old commute idea, you think about the nine to five, like solid period of time in the office, like we're not calculating at all whether this person has any kind of responsibilities at home. We certainly don't cater for someone who ha might, might become pregnant and then need to need to have do intensive primary childcare after birth. We don't, this is not part of the design of work. No. Um, so, you know, maybe the, this new future that we're looking down, it, it may be, an opportunity for us to rethink this um and to you know have more defaults have more personas if you like we talk about in marketing all the time we need to have multiple personas to market different people guess what the world of work has just one persona it's basically 25 year old single dude uh who's yeah got nothing else white. To do you forgot white 25 year old white dude yeah that's yeah. right it's design that's the default and that person you know you can break him down you can you know he's going to do what you need him to do there's no external responsibilities etc mm -hmm. etc yeah. et and all the entire work the career trajectory the, the the learning all the plans are designed around this persona and of course different people don't fit in with that uh which is why of course those people that don't fit in precisely with it will have additional struggles they're not good the, the the game is not the same um and they end up having a handicap so you know maybe it's an opportunity for us to rethink like let's bring in some i some different ways in which people live their lives and think about how work can be designed around multiple personas yeah. anyway um well, this may be related to our chat so let's say this actually i was thinking um, about this when you were saying it it's actually kind of very much related to our chat oh. yeah yeah totally related isn't it um so listen welcome everybody to brain food live on air we're bringing it to you every friday like we always do it is uh episode 129 i'm, I'm thinking it's always 1 130 i'm looking at it all the time but every week it's less than 130 so I'm, I'm sure i'm not sure i'm counting wrong but one more week until 130 um and we're, we've got a really exciting show for you today another intellectual deep dive what is the role of culture, quote unquote, in today's recruiting process? Um, is it something that we can do explicitly in terms of assessing for people, in terms of culture fit? 
is it something we do implicitly without saying it because nowadays you can't see it because it's potentially discriminatory but we do it anyway or is it something that we actively strive not to do in order to make sure we de-bias the recruiting process now the trajectory of culture fit in my view of it it was like had five years where everyone was doing culture fit uh, uh recruiting like this is the only way to recruit you have to do a culture fit more important than technical skills more important than experience we've recruit on culture fit and then it's suddenly become a toxic conversation to have um so this is the exploration of today um anyway let's do a quick sound check as we always do um i want to make sure if you can hear me okay so uh crowdcast i think you can definitely hear me because you've been uh commenting in that way uh shout out to the folks on linkedin if you're watching me on linkedin Good to see you. Give me a thumbs up. Give me one of those emojis that you want to, uh, that are available. Let me know whether you can hear me okay. Or just comment and say, yes, Hong, I can hear you. Um, we are also out. Oh, let me decline that. Uh, this is why I hope no one heard this. Decline what? <laughs> I, I get inbound, man. I mean, I, I literally get inbounds today and I was like, dude, I'm clearly on something. Um, so, uh, so anyway, uh, if you can hear me on, no. Uh, if you can hear me on Twitter, let me know. If you can hear me on Facebook, also let me know. Um, and then we're all ready to go. Okay, so um, quick shout out to our sponsors today, by the way, which is platypus.io. Um, they are a company that do assessment based on team fit. Um, so totally suitable for this topic. And of course, the sponsors always have to do a bit of work as well. We have the CEO of Platypus uh, joining us today as the co-host, Nico Blia Sylvester. How are you doing, Nico? I am good. Thanks, Hung. Thanks for having me. Great to see you, man. Um, I mean, it's always good to see you. It's always good yeah, to see yeah, you. And it's, uh, they always do. I mean, yeah, love those discussions, as you know. I know, I know. And uh, th this has always been one of the things uh, that sort of that has been super interesting. I mean, you and I have got some, uh, Nico has got some really interesting background. So he's actually an ex-recruiter who actually achieved a reasonably decent career. In the <laughs> <laughs> you mean I survived? <laughs> Dude, you were the head of talent at Revolut and stuff like this, were you? And you're like, I was, uh, doing, were you? uh, yeah, head of uh, recruitment at Trustpilot, at Unity, chief people officer at Revolut, among others companies. Dude, yeah. these are like huge companies and huge brand names um, that have all since done better since you left, by the way. Exactly. But, uh, <laughs> Culturally, at least, they're much better places now that I'm gone. But uh, yeah. <laughs> no, but I tell you what makes you a rare beast, Nico, is because you've you've actually gone into a different path from a position of success. Um, so you, you could have easily continued on the CPO route and, you know, work for bigger brands and all these types of stuff, but you stepped out and you, you went and did platypus.io, um, a, a recruiting tech business, which, you know, obviously a journey I made as well. So, uh, massive respect for you on this. We'll talk about platypus in a little bit, uh, deeper, but I think it's totally relevant, obviously to stuff we're talking about today. Um, anyway, let's review the newsletter real quick as something we always do. Um, uh, did you read the newsletter last week? And if so, Nico, what was interesting in it? Four things that uh, I uh, enjoyed reading that either made me laugh or made me think. Um, the first one, do you discriminate against uh, boring people? Uh, genuinely made me laugh a lot because that's the type of humor I enjoy. And then actually I was super reflective about it because uh, it's it's the whole... Uh, uh, so first of all, uh, how do you define what's boring and not boring? I'm probably boring to somebody else. Uh, that uh, I mean, we're all the boring person of someone, right? Uh, and then like uh, the discrimination around, again, I think very good for the, the discussion today. Like, uh, is there a culture of boring, of not boring and, and so on? So I, I really, and I think it was very well written. I mean, it made me laugh a lot. Um, then so I really, tell me. On this, I just shared the link onto the chat stream there. So please do have a look at this. Yeah. Um, this is from Tim Sackett. Um, I don't know if anybody doesn't know Tim Sackett, but he's a, a really famous um, uh, writer, blogger, recruiter in the US. Um, and he is, I call him, I, I think I call him out. He's a, he's a bit of a shit stirrer. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I love it because he always starts conversations that other people are not prepared to start. Um, and I think if you read this post, it's kind of a critique on the overwhelming requirement to de-bias everything which i think more or less we're all aligned with like we, we have I don't, I, I don't know anybody who's you know explicitly prejudiced in their work in our work i think everyone agrees that we need to give people a fair shot mm -hmm. but i think what tim is saying is that look at what point do, do do we do we stop this because there's a moment where we are still making potentially discriminatory decisions like you've had an interview 
you were just thoroughly bored by this person um, because maybe they, they have a mono, uh, like a monotone way of de delivering it. Perhaps they take too long to respond, do all of these things. Like, isn't, is that discriminatory? Um, you know, is that, is that an act of discrimination? I think it's a tough question to, uh, to answer. I mean, potentially, I mean, yeah. And I if mean, you push the idea a little bit further, is any kind of recruitment process just not an act of discrimination in, in a way? Right. You are discriminating outside of filtering. Like, Outside of randomly hiring yeah. people, you're making yeah. a decision saying you're better, you're worse. I'm going to hire this person because I think they're better. And you don't actually know that. Um, you've just got some guesses. You know, you've got some information that you think is worth your decision and you decide that's the case. But is it really the case? Almost anybody rejected might be able to argue the case to say, mm -hmm. hmm, what, what degree of discrimination that is. Uh, Super, super interesting, and, and it's a philosophical topic, but it's written in a very funny way. Very well written. Um, but, uh, but you know what? It's, it's worth thinking about. Like, what are, what are the other factors that we put into play? What about someone who, you know, let's say you've got a high fashion sense, um, and someone walks in and they have a poor fashion sense, um, or a fashion sense that is against yours, or whatever. Are you not making potentially even subconscious decisions to say, you know you what? Are. This person is not right yeah. fit for us, right? Yeah, yeah. 100% so, you are. Very super, interesting uh, read. Super good read. Yeah, yeah. Um, check it out. Tim, Tim Sackett, uh, a regular blogger. So um, uh, you should totally check it out from there. Um, okay. Um, thank you, Markelos. That's a very good um, analysis on that. Um, I think that's, uh, uh, it's, it's worth debating what discrimination really is. In terms of the uh, Oxford English Dictionary, a part of the problem is that the definitions are different as well. The Americans use Merriam-Webster, for instance, and the Brits <laughs> use Oxford English. The, the words don't mean the same. So discrimination, I think, does also mean prejudice in the English, uh, Oxford English language. So it's not just like neutrally discriminating between mm -hmm. two things. It is actually saying you are irrationally doing so uh, based on some sort of supremacist type of view, I think. Um, anyway, um, uh, give us one more. Give us a couple more, actually. Uh, the, um, yeah, the second one I really enjoyed reading for obvious reason was the United Airlines decision to uh, mandate and... Uh, and uh, push for the vaccine uh, across uh, the board of the organization, uh, because I think it's stirring a lot of questions, uh, especially in the US, uh, around uh, uh, what can be done, not be done, should be done, and so on. Uh, uh, I strongly believe they're uh, making the right decision, but that's a personal opinion. Um, uh, yeah, I think it's a good read, and it, it's very reflective. Um, yeah, this one I enjoyed. I enjoyed the, the two do 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 do. Uh, give, me, give me two seconds on this, uh, Nico. Yeah. Um, this is actually a really political. I don't know whether the same thing is happening in Europe and Denmark and UK and stuff like this, but it seems that the argument as to whether you should or should not vaccinate your employees is much more intense in the US than it is in different places. Um, because there is a situation where you see prominent bosses saying you're getting vaccinated and then it blows up in the media and people are rioting. People are saying this is a, a terrible imposition, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it's very, very tough. Now, United Airlines, uh, they, I think what triggered the boss, the CEO of the company to make this decision was because one of their pilots actually um, uh, contracted COVID as a result of obviously doing something quite dangerous. He's in an enclosed space tube all the time he's flying in a plane um and he's interacting with cabin staff he's interacting with other people that may not be vaccinated and he ended up sort of uh being very very ill so he said so the boss basically said you know what every single employee is going to be vaccinated and if that's not right for you you know what there's another business out there that isn't making that rule and you can go and work for those companies but everyone in our company is going to be vaccinated. And it's actually driven vaccination rates up for the companies that have done this. Um, so it seems that the argument is kind of being won, but it's still super political. And it's, it's very also, political because that is that is it uh, should should an organization right. impose something that thank you uh, in, in some country is seen as a, as a you know freedom of choice but actually it should be freedom of choice in every organization uh, oh so in every country right uh, it's it's your responsibility to want and do it and and uh, I, I think where you're right is that the U S from from what I perceive or see uh, um, here based in, in Denmark is that it's a much much bigger uh, discussion around like I want to do it or not want to do it than I live every day in Denmark here it's just I mean, I don't think I've met one person that doesn't want to do it. Yeah, yeah, I think the same thing in Europe generally. It's 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 less 
it's less of an imposition. I think there's a is kind of a, an interest in getting the vaccine generally. So the the population is is, is up for it. Um, uh, uh, but there is a big question. I haven't seen any company say, or I can't remember any company say by mandate this is happening. Um, uh, uh, but it seems to be that's the case in the U U.S. And you know, there's controversy all the way through. It's th there was even a non-vaccination job board. Did you see this a couple of weeks ago? <laughs> no, I, I didn't. Okay, that's. I mean, hey, if there's a way to do business, somebody is going to find a way to do business. So right, I was smart. amazed. That's I was amazed at seeing this, but apparently there's a job board for companies that don't have a vaccine vaccine mandate. So for all those folks who you know have a problem with their company saying you should be vaccinated and you've left that job and you want to go and work for another company that doesn't uh, mandate hey, this, it's smart. There's a job board for you. I don't I don't um, agree with it, but it's smart. <laughs> It's crazy. It's crazy. Anyway, um, I think really interesting politically. And again, it's like another thing that bosses and HR people, TA people have to deal with. Like yeah. when you're interviewing candidates, for instance, let's say we go back to face to face. If we ever do that, like one of the problems might be public health. Like, are you going to ask for a vaccination passport before the person comes on site? What do you do if he refuses or she refuses? Do you reject that person? Does that person then sue you for discrimination? Don't know. Um, it's super interesting. It's uh, it, like just to see. It, uh, yeah, very, very interesting. I had two more that uh, I really enjoyed reading. Um, I had the one on the, the productivity illusion, um, office or home. Uh, and that's linked to a discussion that I've had uh, yesterday uh, because uh, in a uh, in few weeks, I'll be talking at uh, HR TechX in Copenhagen and, uh, and I'll uh, share the the panel with uh, with um, uh, two uh, extremely uh, uh, smart, talented, uh, experienced guy. One from Philips, one from uh, Lego, uh, and uh, and from Philips, uh, he was saying that uh, Philips is back to. Uh, they're doing. They, they've decided to do like three days uh, in the office and two days working from home. And the reason why for people to come to the office is for creativity, not for productivity. His point of view was that or his personal experience was that he's more productive when he's uh, working uh, remote, but uh, for creativity purposes, when you have to do a team brainstorming, teamwork and everything, then nothing beats the office because nothing beats sitting across from each other and spending time together. And, and I mean, we've tried, I've tried doing like a, a, a brainstorming session, a remote in video. It's personally, it's a nightmare. It doesn't work for me, but, uh, but uh, maybe it works for other people. So I, I thought that was a super interesting uh, read again. That makes uh, reflective and then uh, um, the one i really enjoyed for a personal experience in an organization that i worked at uh, was that uh, the the talent shortage uh, credential inflation about uh, you know like finding the a player or what is an a player and, and uh, do you hire a player do they grow within your organization just as a part of evolution because they're um, the best tailored for the ecosystem that you have within the organization and everything i thought that was super interesting and reflective as well on uh, on looking at uh, at recruitment and and uh, and uh, uh, personal development in an organization and everything. Yeah, yeah. And two really interesting and really smart authors as well. Like you, you get, I mean, obviously that's the point of brain food to, to really get some. <laughs> it's almost some, like you do a good job, huh? I mean, <laughs> like, <laughs> it's like if, if someone, I, if someone who's writing something that's intimidating me smart, that's, that's brain food. Yeah. You know, if it, if it caused my brain to hurt a little bit. Okay. That's probably, probably something I should put in. Uh, but they're both really, really good angles on what might be called, uh, I wouldn't say tired topics, but the topics we talk about all the time, but sometimes you just take a different angle on it and mm -hmm. it becomes suddenly refreshing again. Um, and the question that the first author was talking about was, look, productivity is the, the wrong thing to think about when you're looking at location. Um, uh, you're looking at, you know, pr it, it's not about what is productivity, she even asked. Like, how, what, what actually do you think it is? Um, it's like suddenly... We can't answer that question. Um, it is actually about what is the, the product creative output. How creative are you? It's much more important the innovation that comes out. And in mm -hmm. fact, you may need different contexts for innovation. And I agree, in person is, I think, stronger for innovation, for brainstorming, for getting stuff done, sort of, of, of that unstructured stuff done. It seems to be better. Um, and for obviously the A player side, I think that, um, that's been a topic that Kevin Wheeler has been talking about a long time. Like, how do you actually know? Um, uh, what an A player is, you can't actually know unless you've worked with that person in that context. Because, and he used the sports analogy, which I'm sure you and I, you know, being sports fans would understand, is like, you know, star player from Team A goes to join Team B, and guess mm -hmm. what? He's in the subs bench, can't get on the field. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he hasn't got worse as a player. Uh, probably different your system, different environment. Yeah. 
Yeah. Totally. And it transforms his utility to the group. So, you know, um, which is, by the way, why Cristiano Ronaldo is better than Lionel Messi. Um, I, uh, you know because... what? I agree. I, I was always a Messi fan. Uh, um, but but uh, but uh, well, Cristiano is proving in multiple uh, teams, in multiple uh, uh, style of plays, in multiple countries, that he performs systematically. I mean, like uh, constantly. So like... On, in terms of, you know what, in terms of productivity of what is the best for the results of the organization that is joining, you would argue that is the best if we're looking at this as the, the uh, assessment of what is the best. That's the measure. That's the measure. Cristiano basically is the best player in every team he's played for and he elevates every single team he plays for. Second best um, player ever in the history of football after Zidane. But that's obviously uh, a personal... Uh... <laughs> Dude. Gaza is Gaza is better than Zidane. Uh, for, for me, this is clear. Um, uh, this is good. This is good. Okay, okay, we we got to get on with it. Let's talk about this. Let's bring on our guests because you know um, uh, people didn't uh, sign up to this to listen to us to discuss talk football. About Gaza. Yeah. Um, but maybe you did. I don't know. I mean, um, we should uh, do one day a brain food, uh, like uh, yeah, correlation between sports and. Uh... There's actually about the vaccination that we discussed with United Airlines. There's a, an NBA player that uh, just doesn't want to be vaccinated. And I yeah. think he's put on the bench, right? He, they, 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 like, yeah. they don't want to let him play, which is the same logic. Well, you know what? Sports is even, even more interesting because there's a, there's a huge risk. Because obviously, there's, if you turn up and you're not vaccinated, you, you're an elevated risk of infecting your, your teammates. And if you infect a bunch of teammates, actually, that has a direct impact on their performance next week. And that actually might have a, a, an impact on their ability to, to function as a business. Yeah, so it's a, I understand a lot. It's almost like an extreme version of... But does that mean that, uh, that a sports player is not uh, free anymore to make their own choice about what they want? I mean, it's... Yeah, we could go on. Diving into the philosophy. Of it. Anyway, we've got Nims on the show. Welcome back, Nims. Great to see you. Um, and and yeah, for the people who don't know you, Nims, can you quickly introduce yourself? Sure, of course I can. Um, so, hello, everybody. My name's Nims, and I'm an organization design and development partner at the MOD. Amazing. Great to have you back, Nims. And by the way, I was going to I was gonna say before Stan turned up, uh, I love your hair. It looks really good on camera. It's fantastic. Um, the reason why I was prompted to say this is because I, I love Stan's hair also. Um, he's got a new haircut. It looks great. Um, yeah, Nico, you and Nico. I, uh, <laughs> we, we need to step away from this. This is a choice. Part. It's a choice. Yeah. Anyway, Stan, good to see you. Can you quickly introduce yourself to the folks who don't know you? Good to see you as well, Han. I'm Stan. I work for Smart Recruiters, a market-leading talent acquisition suite, and I run partnerships for them in EMEA. Fantastic. And it's great to have you both on the show because we both had conversations about this topic um, in different sort of formats. I thought it would be a great crowd to, to try and knock this one around a little bit. Um, so um, I'm not sure whether you heard uh, sort of the early part of the show and I was talking about the context of why this conversation I wanted to have was my looking at how the entire concept of culture in recruiting was that from 2011 to 2015 is my measurement of it. It seemed to be the only way in which you're able to recruit or you should recruit is culture, culture, culture. That's the only way you should do it. Um, stop looking at CV, stop looking at technical testing. We, we only hiring people that fit our culture. That was the conversation. And then it's like, it felt like a meteorite. It's like suddenly, oh, you can't do that because if you're doing hiring for culture, actually that's discriminatory actually you're just going to hire people that are like you and not like others um it's we can't even do that so i want to explore where we think the word culture is and where does it fit in our recruiting process um can we do it if we are going to do it how do we do it uh, do we do it anyway without admitting it uh you know where are we with it so uh, nims let's go with you on this i mean do you share my view of where the conversation has evolved on culture? How does it look like from the public sector, from these big organizations, you know, in, in your career path? So from the public sector perspective, we don't, we do, public civil service does not recruit for culture at all. We recruit for skills and we look at certain behaviors and all of that is publicly available. So you can go on the civil service, you can look at what the behaviors are and what level is expected. Um, my personal opinion is I'm on the fence with some of this stuff. Um, and I agree, I think people do it implicitly, but they're not going to obviously admit it, right? And some of them might be unconsciously doing it, but still doing it. We don't know. And they probably know because it's unconscious. 
Um, but the gripes that I've got is the fact that we, I feel organizations have a poor understanding of their culture and they're recruiting for a culture that they say exists, but in reality doesn't. Right. So they have a, a kind of a idealized dreamed up view of what their culture is and they recruit against this site, but it's, it's, it's yeah. romantic fantasy. It's like, Pretty that's much. not what's the case. Yeah. Beautiful yeah. words, beautiful words on the wall. Yeah, it's that's what I see all the time. Beautiful words on the wall. And I'm like, get into an organization. And actually, some of it is kind of true, but a lot of it is like not true at all. And the other problem that I've got is if you're going to talk about your culture, what's the dark side of your culture? What is the stuff that you don't do well? And why aren't you being honest with like, these are the people we're looking for, but you've got to put up with this crap also if you want to join our organization. Wow, that's some really important stuff. I mean, two things I thought were really interesting. We'll explore that um, uh, in a moment. Um, but the first thing that was interesting, just to remind myself, is there is a gap between the rhetoric about culture and the reality of culture. Do you agree with that, folks? Let me know whether that's the case. Have you experienced a situation where you've heard the talk on the culture, but then you've encountered an episode whilst you're in the business that you think, hang about, this is like totally not what the thing is. Um, that would be interesting to hear from your opinion on that. And the second thing uh, that, that you mentioned that was interesting was maybe it's actually useful to expose some of the stuff that is certainly part of your culture, but not something that you would advertise, but it's honest. It's to yeah. say, you know what, this happens. Uh, we were working on it, but you need to be aware if you're coming into this, it's going to be a little bit like this. This is part of you know our journey as we go forward. So definitely something to explore. Um, Stan, moving over to you, what is your view on the conversation about culture? Like how has it evolved? Where it, where where has it gone and where it is? Because I think you and I are probably all four of us here probably share kind of a similar level of experience in recruiting. We've been doing it for like ten years plus, right? So we've seen the the, the conversation evolve over that time. Uh, what do you? What's your kind of uh, understanding of the? Uh, how it's evolved as a, as a topic of conversation. In my opinion, we have to step our game up. I'm not on the fence at all about culture. I think it's one of the key denominators for success and failure in business. And I think we need to start hiring for it much more. Um, hiring for skills without defining a good point there. I think uh, too many comments. I think Baker, from Baker, uh, defining it needs to become more empirical, more scientific. And if we manage to do that, then we will change people's lives. We will change people's lives. We will see different behavior over the one year, two year job hopping, you know, coming in somewhere super happy and then quickly finding out, ooh, I'm actually not comfortable here at all. Um, there, there's a way to beat that if we step our culture game up. So why do you think that's the case, Dan? I mean, basically, are you saying, um, have, we, have we kind of... A, are, are we averse to talking about culture as something that we use to, to assess people? Like, what's your explanation or theory as to why we need to step, why the situation is as bad as you say? I think there are a lot of opinions about culture. And there are a few people that have really put in the effort to uh, research it, you know, scientifically. And the people, and, and, and the much of the content that they've produced, I think the recruitment world is far too unfamiliar with it. And if we step our game up, we educate ourselves, I think we'll have a much more um, sophisticated discussion about culture and the misconception that culture, hiring for culture drives inequality, you know, that sort of stuff, um, involving things like race, religious background, uh, gender in culture, which are completely different topics. Um, obviously, they overlap, but they're completely different topics. Uh, yeah, if, if we change that narrative and our thinking around culture, then we'll become much, much better at it. And, and, and the content is there. We just need to get with it, get with the program. All right. Very, just, very uh, interesting. Go ahead, Nico. Yeah, Stan. So, like, I just want to make sure I understand. You're saying that, obviously, so culture should be part of the recruitment process. I'm 100% with you. And saying that you're not taking into account anyone that's saying they're not, they're lying to themselves. So I'm with you on this one. Um, but... Uh, um, are, are you saying that uh, it is important to hire for a culture alignment? Culture, I hate the term culture fit, so I'm trying not to use it, but like a, a culture alignment. Uh, um, and, and because what you're saying is that culture is what's, I'm just repeating what you said, culture is what's going to define your, your failure or your success as an organization. Yeah, no, not just as an organization, as a team, as an individual. If you as an individual are thrown into a culture where you do not fit at all, 
you'll have a bad time. It's like me at the salsa party, you know, everyone's having a <laughs> good time dancing and I'm in the corner like, damn, I should have done more than three courses, you know, right? Is, um, I think oh, everyone oh, can agree with that. Stan, I think everyone can agree with the fact that sometimes you are in a group of people where you are not aligned with the culture of that group of people. I think we've all been in that situation, right? Um, haven't we? I mean, in that scenario, if that bunch of people set up a company, I would want to know <laughs> that my culture doesn't fit in there because dropping me in there is actually a really bad thing. I don't want to be any, any any part of that. So yeah, how, yeah, how David, can we... Uh, or David Beiser has a good one there about heter heterogeneity. It, it, it doesn't have to, you know, culture fit doesn't have to become a synonym for, for, for the sameness. Um, let me let me give you a, an example of two actual companies in Holland. You can probably hear by my accent, I'm Dutch. Um, both have a lion in their logo. Both are Dutch, both orange, both are in finance and banking. They couldn't be more similar. They're both hiring everything that the bank is hiring, you know, fintech, sales, um, consultants, etc. cetera. Uh, Rabobank and ING. Culturally, they could not be more different. You know, if you have a wonderful career at, at, at Rabobank, it's a very traditional local for local bank, culturally, you go into this, you know, agile, uh, fast-moving, tech-style managed and, and cultural company that's ING, it'll clash and vice versa. So on paper, on paper for a bot or for a mat matching algorithm, these companies are essentially the same. But actually, in practice, they're completely different than the people that are there. And, and these are diverse people, by the way. These are not just men, just women, just the same ethnicity, just the same hobbies. No, these are people with a very broad spectrum of, of, of things that they like to do, and where they're from, and who they are, how old they are. But the culture of these companies is completely different. And we need to start appreciating that. IBM and Microsoft, right. you know? Let, let, let's, 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 this goes all the way back to Nim's first point, which was, like, we have a rhetorical um, a, 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 a treatment of culture and all the rhetorical becomes cliche by the way because it's all like yes we're flat culture, flat structure with this this and this is all it literally you could do a, a mini word cloud and it would be the same words um so but there is cultural difference in reality in terms of how different organizations operate um now how can we actually get beyond the rhetoric and figure out the reality nims You've actually done some work on this, haven't you? This is actually your professional thing. So give us some ideas how we go about doing that. Yeah, there's a bunch of recruiters, TA people working in companies now. They would have no clue how to get beyond the rhetoric and to get to reality. So how, how do they actually understand what the culture is in the company? How would they do it? So what we do in the civil services, we have, a pro, we have an intervention called the culture inquiry. And what the culture inquiry is about is understanding the organization through forms of storytelling. What do people say about the organization? What stories do they tell about the organization? And that is where you get the culture from, from their experiences, because our experiences are hooked into our stories and what happens in organizations. If we can extract the stories and form a pattern, where are the same stories turning up? Where are we getting commonality and where are we getting differences? You get a picture of what the organizational story is, i.e. the organizational culture. All right, so that's, that's, that sounds to me like a qualitative, qualitative uh, data collection exercise, and it's probably a survey, isn't it? Like you send people something to say, right, fill this in, no? It's not a, it's not a survey, it's getting people in a room or on Teams or on Zoom, having a conversation. We get, we use like virtual whiteboards, people stick stuff on. It is qualitative, but then we turn that into quantitative data. So, you know, what are the most common themes that are mentioned? What is the words that are used? Where are the, so we do the groups and themes encoding in all of our content, and then we build a picture of what the narrative of the organization really is. That's really interesting. Um, so you even doing some word analysis, like what are the terms people tend yep. to surface up and use? Because because th that words carry the culture, right? So the people, you know, you about to say something? Yeah, and what we also do is what we notice that what's happening in the culture inquiry. How are people's behaviours? Are they really talkative? Are they not? Are, do we feel as facilitators that they're holding back? They're not telling the truth. Is this a safe space for them? And then we kind of be able to add that into our inquiry in terms of actually there, there's something much deeper happening with this organisation or with this group or team. 
that's something that Andrew just mentioned there. It, it, he said that what if there's a negative story, people might not feel as if they could they could surface that up. So how do you make sure that those those people are able to speak or that that information is able to be kept collected? So we design it in a way where we are grouping people. You know, so for example, MOD or any civil service quite hierarchical. So we group people in the relevant grades or grade structures to extract the stories, to create the safe environment. Even then we still get reluctance for people sharing what's really going on. It's up to the facilitators, i.e. me or my colleagues to pick that up and notice that. So we do make notes about, you know, the fact that this isn't a safe place or there are some stories and we're just getting, you know, the kind of the, the, ice, the top of the iceberg from that perspective, but it's a hell of a lot deeper than what's posted on the walls on a website. Right, very, very good. To stick on this just while a little bit on longer. on the wall on the um, website, I love this. Yeah, thing. <laughs> there's, there's one more thing I want to ask. Basically, what are the questions that would trigger the, stor the storytelling? Because I think that part of okay. the skill is, you know, how what is the question? The question is, it's really simple. So what we do is we have, this is a place where we are your people and they fill it in. So it is completely open to interpretation. You can say, this is a peop this is a place where I am developed. This is a place where I feel as if I can have a voice. Or this is a place where, you know, hierarchy wins. All right, rewind so that back, folks. Basically, yeah. you start a question and then have the person like auto fill it, essentially. Uh, this is a place where, and then you got free text, and then that will tell you how you feel about the organization. Stan, you're about to say something? Yeah, because um, if, if people are interested in this, that there isn't a better, uh, I think, piece of uh, content than Erin Meyer's book called The Culture Map. Uh, she, she has got a PhD, uh, thanks for this, um, by doing this research, and she identifies pretty much seven segments that define a culture. Um, and I'll read them up because I, I don't know them by heart, but a communication is one, um, direct or indirect, try having a conversation, a management conversation in, in a Japanese boardroom and in an American, completely different dynamic. Uh, evaluation, are you evaluated in front of your colleagues? Even negative feedback, which is fine in Holland, but if you do that in some other countries, it's massive disrespect. People will be really hurt. That's culture. Uh, leading, is it very hierarchical? You just mentioned it, Nims, or is it uh, egalitarian? Um, deciding, is that top-down or is it consensual? Uh, trusting, is it task-oriented or relationship-based? Uh, and then finally, disagreeing and scheduling. How is that managed? You know, is it flexible time, linear time? Example, again, ING is known for its very flexible work culture. Rabobank is 9 to 5. Exactly the same type of company on paper, completely different work culture. You send an email to someone at Rabobank at 9 p.m. and you, you offended them. You do it at ING, it's totally normal. That those right. those seven elements define the culture. You know what? I think that Erin Meyer structure. She's actually pr probably the most famous crossover person I think in our space. Uh, in other words, like a half anthropologist, half work consultant person. Um, and she's she's written a, a really popular book. I think it's called The Culture Map. Um, and she creates these kind of cultural personas as to generally speaking, you know, this is how it operates in different countries. I think really interesting to review. Um, and her structure, I think, might be something that's worth just documenting because it could create it could be a useful framework for us to analyze our own company co uh, cultures, because and that could combine very well with the qualitative um, uh, work. Uh, that NIMS is doing. So in other words, let's surface out what people are really thinking. Um, and then we can kind of have a look at how our structures are either encouraging or discouraging or promoting some of these behaviors or feelings. Um, because I do think it's possible, um, it, it's totally possible to engineer a culture in some way, or at least to, to create, create a, a system which creates or uh, encourages behaviors, which then generates uh, it manifests itself in, 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 in ways that we would describe as culture. Um, okay, uh, Nico, uh, let's not be quiet on this. I know that sort of... No, I mean, what you just said, what you just said, uh, like, because, because of the nature of platypus, we have data now on this about, like, company culture, what we see in, in certain organizations. And because of the granularity of the tool, we have data well, now of... Uh, Rewind back. What is the data you're collecting again? I forget. We ask, uh, it's a little bit like uh, Erin, it's a little bit of Schneider and Denison as well, because they are pretty good as well in terms of PhD dudes that have uh, written uh, stuff on company culture and so on. Uh, but basically what we, what we do in a way 
it's uh, it's uh, Nims and I talked about this in the past when uh, when we looked uh, together a little bit at Platypus is we we try of like asking basically every single employee to uh, to reflect on what is important to them what's going to drive them in terms of their culture what do they care for you know we have 12 core cultural drivers and uh, and basically they have the room anonymously to think about you know what this is what's important to me because our concept is that um the the stuff that Nims and I love you know the beautiful words on the wall or like uh, what I call the beautiful corporate values that absolutely not uh, define the culture of an organization uh, uh, is autocratic and and our view is that culture is democratic every single person with what is important to them a little bit like uh, what uh, what you said stand around in uh, impacts the culture of an organization so it's about giving the room to the person anonymously that's the difference with uh, with uh, with names but anonymously to to uh, build a cultural uh, um, heat map of what they care for and then aggregate all these data from every single employee with an algorithm that we've put in place because yes everyone impacts the culture i think we would be lying if we would say everyone has the same impact on the culture that's that's uh, you know unfortunately and not not true um, and then we were capable of basically giving cultural map of organizations we have companies currently using us in europe asia and the us and the beauty of it is um to then being able to follow not only in customer success but with like satisfaction surveys around this is important to you as a subgroup of person because we can granularly look at what's my subculture in Copenhagen tech versus uh, London marketing and so on and so on, all your sub departments, and follow that with a satisfaction on what is important to me because that tells you then is the culture, the perceived culture, the wanted culture, and am I aligned with with you know what is important to me in the organization? That's where it becomes super important. And where I was going on the on when or what the uh, Stan was saying around like you know the, the the behavior linked to what is important to you. We see this in uh, in our current customers that obviously I cannot share because I don't want to go to JDDPR uh, jail. You know, like not nice. Uh, but uh, but uh, we see massive differences in organization, uh, just like you're describing with the two uh, Dutch uh, giants. Uh, when you said like you know they're orange with the lion on thing, I thought you were talking about the national team in football. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, every, every company in Holland mandatorily has to have an orange lion. Orange and a lion. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But uh, but uh, it is so, and I think linking to you know the, the discussion that we're having at the start, like a uh, uh, culture in the recruitment process, the fit or whatever. I think what you said, uh, um, uh, Hung, uh, it used to be all about culture. Culture hit breakfast, like a like strategy for breakfast. We hire for culture, not for skills. Everyone said this. Everyone was lying, but everyone said this. Uh, but uh, but. Uh, uh, I think now it's more around, uh, I don't like the term culture fit. I don't think you uh, you hire for culture fit. Uh, I think you look at where are, where are we close and where are we not close? And how do we best work together? Uh, and what will be the impact that you bring in the subculture of my team? And, and All right. Let, let's just nail this. Oh, nail, sorry, no, no, no. Again, go go was, ahead, Stan. That was so spot on when you said subculture of my team. I think that's where you nailed it. You nailed it because what really Thanks, annoys Stan, me I like as a marketer, you. I like you, Stan. It, it, yeah, what, what, what really annoyed, uh, annoys me as a marketer um, and, and used to annoy me a lot when we uh, created campaigns for corporates is that they were trying to uh, market their company. You know, if, if you're an international company, you're already done. Every com every country will, will, will engage differently with the content you produce. But then on the team level, there are huge differences. Mm -hmm. what, if you don't believe me, anyone listen to this, be a fly on the wall when we go back to the office uh, or in your Slack channel of, of that specific team, in your market, marketing team's uh, department uh, or in their Slack channel, and then do the same thing in your bookkeeping's department. And I'm pretty sure you will see some, some minor differences between, uh, between the interaction. Same goes for sales and engineering. That you can have multiple subcultures within the wider organization and the better you can identify, at that point you can hire talent and, and match it uh, where it adds, where it adds value, indeed. But you can't put someone in a team that loves to go out for drinks every day. When I mean, you hate that, you want to keep a bit of a dif distance from your colleagues. That's the culture you want. If you put someone like that in a team, that's like, yeah, hey, yeah, we're going out again, we're going to waste it. You're going to have a that person going to have a bad time. It won't work no matter how much you try. Okay, let's uh, let's let, let me just intercede here. Um, uh, firstly, I'm a big fan of being able to pick up like all of the metadata that's occurring within businesses these days because we're all digital that means there's a huge digital exhaust that's being created in terms of how we communicate we can mine that information and we can actually figure out how 
uh, different teams operate. So you mentioned things like, oh, how different uh, departments have you know these Slack channels. Well, actually, you could probably count the number of interactions in these Slack channels per person, um, or you could count how long those interactions are. Like, do, do people type long considered messages, or is it like emoticons or whatever? And you could make some general assessments to say, you know what, this is a very light and friendly type of environment. They're doing a lot of chat and work. That's all cool. Uh, this is super serious. Uh, the Slack channel, like, <laughs> it's heavily played. That tells you a lot. However, that gets us into all kinds of privacy issues and all those types of conversations about, you know, bossware and stuff, uh, uh, leaving that uh, conversation to one side. But I think we can and do have the information to figure out we have culturally yeah. where we're at. Um, but Nico, you mentioned something earlier about the hiring side, and Stan, you touched upon it as well. Uh, Nims, let's bring you into this conversation also. Like, how does it actually get to the point where we're hiring somebody um, and we think that person is not going to fit in? Um, with <laughs> the, the subculture of the team. Um, now, this person has technically kicked the ass out of it. Amazing. Um, CVs there, profiles there. All of it's telling me, yeah, this should be a tick in the box. But I know this person is going to be a disaster. Um, sometimes you put someone in the team, it's just not going to gel. It's actually going to be very destructive. How? What are we advising that person? Um, because we are well into the thick of the weeds of discrimination here. Um, like how do we how do we separate this understanding of uh, this person not aligning with the culture, or, or I guess this person not aligning with the culture, and discrimination? Or is discrimination just a heuristic for culture fit? How do we do that? I have no idea. I think it's a messy, <laughs> messy question. I really don't have the answer to that because I think that to put it down and articulate it is a story that we tell ourselves that, oh, we're doing it because it, they're not going to fit into our culture. And I wonder if you ask people, is that really true? I mean, deep down, what are they afraid of? Conflict, the team going down, like there's much more deeper meanings that we are putting on to say, oh, this person's going to be the wrong fit because they don't want to piss off their teammates for hiring the wrong person because they don't want to manage this person. You know, what's the real reason? And let's just get on with it and put our big boy pants on and say, this is what the problem is going to be, because that's what I noticed. I think there's actually underlying issues that prevent us from hiring. And perhaps, you know, we're afraid of it. What are what are teams scared of, right, from difference? From is, is it not legitimate not though? Like, let's say I hire someone and I know this person will piss off the rest of the team. Isn't that not a legitimate decision as a manager? I'm thinking, you know what, this person may give me a plus one in terms of their own performance, but they're going to lead to minus three from everyone else. My entire unit is going to go worse. No go. Uh, isn't that like a legit call? As a no, because I'd say you need to sort out your conflict management skills and so do the team. <laughs> right? I'm sorry, but you Don't. do. You're right. I'm, I, you know, fair enough. We're, we're, I, I, we're, I, I, we're I, I, adults. I, 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 and we we need to be able to you know sort out our differences, not like children do in the playground, but as adults do, and saying you know we need to stop being so polite about stuff and say this is what's not working, and treat the other person like an adult and a human being. Right, I think that's a totally fair point. Go ahead, Stan. There's a good comment for Christy from Christy there, uh, which I believe uh, with until the word surprise is used, because um, yes, you know, uh, I fully believe. That's interesting to throw someone with a different type of cultural preference into a dynamic and see what kind of new dynamic is created. You know, yeah. that, that's how we evolve from amoebas to where we are right now, uh, having a digital <laughs> conversation, you know, through these mutations. And Nims is right. But it's the responsibility to manage more. more. We, yeah, exactly. We, we don't have I mean, to be surprised anymore with, with tools like Platypus, with tools like Company Match, and with other empirical data and, and analysis and assessment tools that we can use up front. We, we can actually see if this could work, but there's another thing that we can do without any technology. And that's actually taking that person and bringing that person to the team and having them spend three days with the team, you know, maybe working on a project together, design sprint together, or maybe coding a little bit together, or maybe working on some kind of commercial go-to-market idea together and just see how the collaboration goes. And, and then instead of us being the person that rejects someone because of cultural fit, we can actually go like, hey, hun, what do you think? Will, will, will you survive here or or would you hate it here? And then Han goes, you know what? Honestly, after these three days, I don't feel like I'm 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 really I'm a great fit for this culture. That is actually Han that can choose. And right now everyone's hiring, right? So I, it, it's it's probably even better 
for Hunt to realize or the recruiters to say like, hey, you'd probably hate it here. And Hunt to find a place where he's happy and will stay for a long time. It's not having to job hop after six months, one year to, to another company blindfolded every time only to find out later that it wasn't a fit. All right. So I think the idea of like literally getting a work trial in is obviously the best way to figure this out, right? Um, because it's, it's better than any kind of proxy that you've got. You've literally got a period of time where the person's interacting. I think that's probably true. That's However, time to practically, but practically, that's really difficult. Logistically, it's not always yeah. possible. I mean, like, uh, I love the idea. That's the best case scenario with everything, right? But I think as well, like, uh, uh, on top of this, and, and I'll uh, rebound on what Nim said, it's 100% uh, the responsibility of the manager. If you decide, like, let's kill culture fit because it's wrong and it's disgusting uh, and it's about culture ad or culture alignment or whatever, but it's 100% the responsibility of the manager that people should work well together. That's, I mean, that's my job. That's why I'm paid to put people in the best situation possible to perform. That's why I'm the manager, right? So uh, uh, crisis management or uh, multicultural uh, uh, training or, or uh, I mean, uh, accepting differences, um, but Nims, like your thing around, like, you know, people should uh, be adults. I think um, I give up on this one. I mean, I, I don't just, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, firstly, uh, Nims, what do you, but hold on. Wait. <laughs> what do you mean you give up on that one? I, I think like one line I love to use is like, uh, you know, uh, common sense, not so that common. Uh, so I give up on, on this. That, um, like, uh, okay, yeah. Nico, have more faith in humanity, please. I, I'm French. Obviously not. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But I want to add one thing. I want to like say, I I do not fit into, I'm going to upset Alan, I do not fit into the MAD culture. Absolutely not. But I am thriving in that culture. Because you love to change things. Because I love to change things. And I bring creative tension in my role. Yeah. Right? I add the difference. I do not fit in 100%. My leg is always halfway out the door. Right? But I'm there because of the challenge. Right? And I'm there because I'm provocative. Yeah. All right. Let, let's let's now um, move on to a different way. Thank you for everyone's contribution there, by the way. Um, let's move on to a the next stage. So we've got a bunch of people listening to this, and they're thinking, "All right, this is this is great. Um, I need to understand my culture better. We've got some ideas as to how to do that, whether it's through using tooling or using um, the uh, a more qualitative way of of surfacing up this information. All kinds of ways to to figure this out. Um, how do we actually implement something in the recruiting process?" Um, that's going to help us like understand uh, the alignment that this person has with the existing culture. And not to say we're going to say disalignment means a veto, but it, it helps the hiring manager and the team understand what else needs to happen in order for this new person to potentially succeed. So I may, for instance, hire someone uh, who is a complete maverick, let's say. Um, you know, needs to drive the car, needs to do their own thing, isn't really going to, you know, be, be, be fit into a, a narrow scope type of role. That's great. But how do I figure that out in a way that isn't just my gut feel? Is there is there some sort of way in which we could do that in the assessment flow or, or whatnot? Any any thoughts on this? Uh, Nims, go with you on this first. You ask them about their preferences. No, I'm asking thought. about how do we understand the, the the cultural yeah. alignment aspect um you, in a you ask them how, process to me you ask them what their preferences are how do you like to be how do you like to be managed all right I see kind of, yeah okay yeah I'm, I'm gonna ask it straight out in terms of what i know about my organization and my culture and then actually what are their preferences what's really important to them in a working environment how do they like to operate do they like to be managed closely or do they like you know like you said like lots of free reign they want to drive the car themselves pretty much like me you know leave me alone and just let me get on with that and I'll do my job or do they want something you know a little bit with a little bit more support so I'd be right out and say just just ask the questions about their preferences instead of relying on your gut feel staying with that just a little bit as a follow-up question Nims I think that's a really good way to address that first issue um, how would you then communicate um, a lack of cultural alignment so I've asked you the question, okay, Nims, what do you reckon you want? What do you want? You're, you've given me all the a list of things. I've got the information. That's great. It's not aligned to this particular context I've got. How do I kind of express that to the candidate? Yeah, but you're making an assumption that I actually hire for cultural fit and you're definitely <laughs> asking the wrong person. So not a question that I would be willing to answer either way, but I wouldn't take it into account. I'd want to know their preferences, but then I'd work out my style 
according to their needs, right? And I would help my team to understand what their needs are. So for me, a lot of it about changing the culture is about changing the interactions and how people interact within a team and how to accommodate and bring people in. Because that person who I'm hiring that doesn't actually fit or align to my culture can be bringing something that this team bad needs and I just don't know it yet. 100%. That's true. I, I, do, I do think that's true. But there's, the alternative side to this um, is also this person may be a danger to the team in some way. Um, in other true. words, they may come in. You can't be overly accommodating all the time to every new person. That's why there's, there's a probation. That's what there's a probation period. There's a right? probation period. Um, I'm not overly accommodating because I have no <laughs> problem telling my candidates about what the boundaries are and how we work. Sure, I want a collaborative environment, but we work with respect and, you know, understanding our boundaries. So for me, it's about helping that person understand the boundaries and how we work and, you know, where are their boundaries in all of this and how can we create a more of a collective picture of how we want to work in addition to meeting some of their needs. Yeah. Oh, shit. Sorry. I forgot one thing. Uh, and one thing that I, we always try and do on this show is to make sure that we are not the bottleneck for this conversation, folks. So if you've enjoyed talking about culture and you want to connect with everybody, please take a moment to share your LinkedIn um, profile in the chat stream right now and, and then make sure you can go and connect with everyone else that's part of this conversation, whether it's on the panel or in the chat stream or whatever. Um, I think if this topic's interesting to you, it's also interesting to all of the other people that signed in and watching the show. So make sure you connect with those folks and give yourself the opportunity to, to, to follow up this conversation uh, at another moment when we conclude this. Um, so go ahead and put it in the chat stream now. Um, okay, uh, Nico, let's go with you on this. Um, so, so Nimbus is basically saying, okay, great. You can sort of surface up the... Uh, uh, person's self-awareness of their own behavior. I mean, let's assume they, they know that, but let's, you can surface up by a direct question. Um, how would you also, would you, how would your approach be if uh, you wanted to express to that person, you know what, there isn't really the, a very close alignment with how this person prefers to operate and how we as a business or we as a team operate? I mean, I don't want, um, I'm not... Uh... I'm not a believer of uh, hiring for a culture fit or culture match. Uh, I'm a big believer of uh, shake things up uh, and create a cultural diversity, bring people that are going to think differently, that I care for, for different things. Because my goal, and I'm looking at me personally, at, at another person in my organization, is to have uh, uh, the most diverse culture possible because I'm building a tool that's supposed to, uh, to uh, be used by everyone. Uh, everyone should be able to connect with Platypus. And in order to, uh, for everyone to be able to, uh, to use my product, uh, I need my uh, culture to be able to represent everyone. Um, so for me, it's never about, uh, uh, when we hire here, it's never about uh, looking at cultural fit, but it's about having data for me to understand better what, what Nim is saying. What is important to that person, not important to that person? How is that correlating to the team that they're going to join? If I have that data, then I can have like a proper discussion of like, this is what you'd experience here in that team with those people, uh, how do we best make it work moving forward? All right, I think that's actually a really good line to use. Like, this is what you would experience here. Um, and obviously, you would hopefully know that information, not from the re rhetoric, but you might have gone through an exercise where you've surfaced the reality of it. And then you could really say, or even done the meta-analysis of it, you know, you can understand, you know, how people communicate and talk and all that type of stuff. So you can literally say, you know what, this is generally what happens if you join our company or join this team, you can experience these things. Um, and that person needs to be fully aware of it. Um, even if it means that there could be some modification of behavior one way or the other in there order will be. To, uh, to get in there. Um, okay, same question to you, Stan. Um, the, here's the scenario. Um, you've interviewed somebody, you're in the process of interviewing. There is a, a lack of alignment in terms of what you think this person's preferred mode of operating is and what your team's mode of operating is. How would you kind of express this difference um, to this person? So um, I've been uh, battling hard here for, uh, for a culture fit and culture match or however you call it semantically, but... Um, my personal opinion is when push comes to shove, we're not looking either for skills alone or culture alone. We're looking for chemistry, actual chemistry. So what I would discuss with this person and would try to find out with this person is how much chemistry there is. So I actually, you know, I love to shake things up uh, as well. Um, I also love, you know, when, when, when people uh, or where, where 
certain things are a shoe in. You know, this will this will fit like a glove, right? As but in, in a recruitment conversation, you you really do want to know, you do want to try and assess through assessments, through trial periods, whether there's chemistry or not, because that that will be the difference maker between succeeding or failing uh, as a business and as an individual. And you know what? Chemistry is um, a term we use to describe relationships a lot, but but it actually may be biochemical. Um, it's biochemical, I mean, right? Yeah, it's like the, the olfactory senses are actually hugely relevant. Now, this actually has a huge implication in terms of where we're at with distributed working, because obviously we can't smell through a computer. Um, and, you know, we, we were lacking a lot of the other things that we would pick up um, in an in-person situation. So theoretically, and again, this is like maybe moving towards more controversial position, but at maybe a distributed workforce, perhaps the cultural fit is going to look very different. Like the, the idea of cultural uh, matching or cultural alignment perhaps could be very, very different, maybe less significant than being in a room uh, together nine to five, five days a week. I, I don't know. Um, I disagree. I strongly disagree, Hung. Okay. Finally, finally, something we disagree upon. I'm tired <laughs> of agreeing with you. Seriously. <laughs> no, I, I, um, think, uh, I think I uh, think uh, understanding uh, uh, the culture is even more important uh, because less... Uh, tangible when you're remote. Uh, we have some of our customers that are uh, fully remote organizations, uh, and, and that is the idea of why they're using a platypus, to really better understand the data. Uh, uh, it's easier to feel it and understand it when we're all sitting in the same room. It will be much faster to understand uh, because we're sitting next to each other and you will start seeing me behaving a certain way for eight to nine hours per day. Uh, uh, and and you'll, you'll, understand, you'll understand much, much faster. Um, so it's more critical to understand when you have remote or some of your team members that are remote, what actually drives those people and what is the culture and, and way more important to describe it and, and, and share it in the recruitment process. In, in my All view. Right. You know what? One thing I need to say, I'd really love to see some more data coming from Platypus. I don't know whether you, you, you produced any of this publicly, um, Nico, soon, but I, soon, I would soon. be, yeah, yeah. I'd be very interested to know like some of the stuff, obviously anonymized and what have you, but I think that could really help evidentialize some of these things yeah. and help help people figure it out a little bit better. Um, because I, th I still think we're a bit weak generally about this. Um, so we've, had, we've had some people uh, uh, using us. We've had some people that have shared their, uh, their uh, company uh, print uh, and their uh, company uh, 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 like cultural map and everything. I don't know if it's a good idea. I mean, like uh, I'm here to provide data. They decide what they do. Personally, I think... Uh, uh, it should be anonymous, um, but uh, but it's up, up to them. But we are looking at at uh, uh, before the end of the year, uh, doing some like white paper of what have we seen so far with the organization using us, aggregating all this data, showing some stuff, you know, per location, Scandinavia versus the the, the US versus the UK, because we have uh, customers there. W what trends do we see? Yes. I would love to see that because I think there are obviously national differences, cultural differences, uh, often driven by history, driven by law as well. That makes a huge difference. Uh, I think in the U.S. organization, for instance, at will contract is a basic thing. I think that's a hugely significant uh, a bit of, uh, if you like, a legislation or a corporate rule that makes people's relationship with organizations very different. Um, and, and that, you know, is totally different from a different place in a, in a, in a place, let's say, uh, where you can't release people that easily France classic example, um, maybe, uh, maybe you, you'd create very different cultures by those things. We don't have the time, unfortunately, to get to the point of doing some social experimentation on company culture. I'd, I'd love to do this a little bit more, uh, you know, how can you create experiments to change how culture works, um, and, and drop in, let's say a big rule, or oh, we're all doing this now suddenly see how that impacts uh, culture in some way uh you know treat your employees as a uh, as guinea pigs should we say um but we'll have to do that as a as, as a as a part b come on why not you know have a bit of fun with your life uh, <laughs> this is why we've got to end the show before i say anything other uh, any, anything more that might get me into trouble um anyway uh listen let's leave it with a final comment from everybody um is there one resource that you wish that other people will literally go ahead and read or get access to to kind of increase their literacy with regards to uh, company corporate culture. There's a lot of people watching this are really being interested in the topic, but they may be looking for other ways to have a deeper dive. Uh, what is there one thing you would cite? Say, okay, check this out. Um, Nims, have you got any thoughts on this? 
Yeah, I do. I would probably say look at Edgar Schein's work on culture. Can you pick up a link on the book or something like that and share in chat yeah. streaming? That'd be super useful. Nico, let's go to you. Uh, aside from platypus, like what else? Uh, what else? Should... <laughs> I would never ever say this. Okay, that's not my. What style. else should they look at? Uh, like again, me personally, uh, uh, very much love uh, Schneider and Denison. Uh, whatever uh, stuff they came out with in terms of the books, their their vision and their uh, their view on uh, on culture within an organization. They've built great yep. framework as well. I like it a lot. Cool, cool. Share that link of something that they've done in the chat stream so that people can go pick that up. Um, okay, outside of Erin Meyer, um, Stan, what else should people be looking at or experimenting with or, or picking up? I, I like this company called Platypus. Uh, <laughs> there, there, there's, there you go. Uh, there's another one as well uh, that, that um, I recommend people have a look at. It's called Company Match, and they have a culture assessment tool that's free for candidates to use. Um, so if you have a team, they can just run the assessment completely free of charge, figure out what their culture is. Uh, companies, if they then want to assess it for themselves, they do have to pay. So, um, but, the, but, the, but the free the free, <laughs> free stuff is always good. So uh, yeah, have, have a look at companies. I agree. I, I think I think it would be cool like for companies to have a way to just produce it because I think that, you, you know, we've got, I wouldn't say we've got to dumb it down, but we have to make it more doable um, for someone who is a non-specialist. Um, there's going to be too many people that are just essentially generalists trying to pour their way forwards can we help you know put down a, 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 a another brick in the road for them uh, to, to move forward anyway um this is it for the rest of the show i think we, we have to do a, a round two and something like this it's been a, a really interesting one to talk about sorry we haven't actually got to the questions uh we don't have the time for it we'll, we'll have to to, to re, uh, re, re regroup and revisit um okay that's about it everybody uh we are back next week um i forget what we're talking about oh we might actually be going to india next week we're going to do a virtual tour of recruiting in india um it's going to be at 9 a.m uh because i'm going to do it in india time uh so if you're interested in like one of the most dynamic markets um that is happening in the world right now in terms of recruiting and also i think one of the most unique um because a lot of the challenges that indian recruiters have are literally nothing like the challenges that people outside of india have tune in for that show it's going to be super interesting uh we've got uh, recruiters from accenture from uh facebook from uh, cap gemini uh, and also some smaller organizations in india as well they're going to tell us about okay this is what our problems are it's going to be super fascinating okay that's about it everybody uh everybody have a good weekend um uh, nims thank you so much for joining us on brave food live great to have you uh we'll catch up with you soon and Stan, great to see you again. Uh, say hi to the family. We'll see you soon, sir. All the best. Bye-bye. And Nico, thanks for co-piling, man. Great to have you on the show as usual. And, uh, and yeah, hopefully we'll catch up soon, dude. Have a good one, my man. Take it easy. Okay, folks, that's it. I hope you've enjoyed the show. If you have followed the channel, uh, we do this every Friday, usually at 2 p.m. BST. Um, uh, but uh, next week, as I reminded you, I think we're going to do it at 9 a.m. Um, and uh, I urge you to tune up for that if you're looking uh, to better understand how different countries wrestle with some of these recruiting challenges. Uh, okay, that's about it. Have a good weekend.